Hi everyone, my name is Rebecca. I'm a first year PhD student from the University of Exeter. Uh, this presentation is going to be slightly different from the other ones you've seen because very soon after starting my lab work, we went into lockdown so I couldn't go in anymore. Um, so instead, I'm going to be talking about the background behind my research and what I'm looking at doing when I'm allowed back. I could have done some of my previous research where I did have results, but I thought I was really excited to talk about this at the conferences I couldn't go to. So I thought BioRoom was a really good opportunity to, to be able to talk about my work. So this is the evolution of ageing and late life disease. So just over a month ago, a meeting in the UK House of Lords, uh, everyone was told that we need more funding in research to ageing and longevity. So it's a really, really big topic in so many fields and it's now been taken to really, really high levels. And one of the questions that was asked in the meeting was, do we think the UK is as ready as other countries when this, come, when this industry comes to becoming even bigger? Because ageing is everywhere. So that before focused more on humans, but it's definitely not just about that. So I'm going to be focusing mostly on metazoans, so animals, but um, that's only because single-celled organism and cellular senescence are slightly different. Uh, so here at the beginning, you've got a Pinta Island tortoise. This was the last of his species. He's called Lonesome George, and he died when he was 100 years old. Um, next to him, you've got a former bird. They live to about 40, dogs to about 15, nematode worms to about 30 days, etc., etc. So there's a huge range here. Um, and we don't quite understand everything about why this is here. Why, if natural selection is so powerful, why do things still get old and die? There's, there's got to be some sort of use there. That's what evolutionary theory tells us. But it's, it's going to be the world's biggest industry. So the UK House of Lords, they were told to prepare for this, basically. And it's been mentioned in so many books and news reports. Because everywhere you see there are drugs that will help you live longer. There are face creams to help you look younger and stop aging. Antioxidants, I could do a whole presentation just on science's relationship with <laughs> antioxidants, um, but I won't go into that too much. But this idea basically died out, should have died out in the, the 2000s, but people still believe now if you eat lots of antioxidants, you're going to live longer. Uh, that's not necessarily true, but there's still work going, going into it. And there's lots of money in, in blog posts and videos and vlogs, um, what to eat so you can live longer and live healthier. Because it's not just about living longer. If, if you live longer and still get sicker and sicker, that's not going to be very good for the person's well-being, not very ethical for, for animals. You're keeping living longer like livestock if they're just getting iller. And in terms of humans, it's bad for the economy as well because these people will be getting older and living up resources but not, not being able to, to work. And the media, drink coffee to live longer, three cups a day to help ward off killer diseases. Now this journalist maybe didn't read well it's, it's clearly not true is it? but um so it's killer diseases it's so striking everyone's talking about this but we still don't know even why aging happens in nature that's still very much just theory based so what am i going to be looking to do about it so if we take a step back and go back to evolution to be able to understand this, we need to sort of know what happens to natural selection throughout lifespan that eventually leads to aging, um, late life disease and death. So when you're younger, as you reach the mean age of reproduction for your strain or your species, your natural selection force is really, really high. Um, I started off with birth here, but this also occurs before birth, like in the embryo. It's still very high there. So any sort of mutations here that are bad, that could result in you dying or reduce your fitness, then they're going to be selected against really, really strongly. But when you go past this mean age of reproduction ceasing, you've already most likely passed on those genes. So any mutations that gets to you here, it's, it's probably a bit too late. It's hard for natural selection to reach you because you've already passed that on. So the two main widely accepted theories around this um, come from this idea. The first one makes sense. It's called mutation accumulation hypothesis. This basically means that those mutations as you get older build up and they can cause things that make you age, things that make you die. Um, 
and they, they basically just stay in the lineage because you're still passing them down. The second theory is called antagonistic pleiotropy. It's very similar to this, except the same genes that do something that's harmful when you're older, they're actually selected for because when you're younger, they, they do something that helps you. So the first peak, they're beneficial, so they're selected for, and then they come to make you age quicker or bring you to your death after this point. So what am I doing to look behind these ideas? So I'm going to introduce you to my model organism now, which I didn't get to spend much time with before the lockdown. Uh, before that, these are just some examples in humans. Um, so you've got mutation accumulation, you've got um, presbycusis, which is uh, when you, you lose your hearing when you get older, um, and you can get a cochlear implant if it gets really bad. Alzheimer's, ataxia, which is um, losing voluntary motor function in diabetes. Um, and antagonistic pleiotropy, you've got all these examples that happens in humans. So these theories are likely to occur in different types of aging, in different species, in different amounts. Uh, the most infamous one here is probably sickle cell disease. If you're heterozygous for this disease, you can get protection against malaria. Um, and if you're homozygous, then you, you have anemia. Um, I'm not necessarily saying that getting the benefit in antagonistic pleiotropy is always worth the harmfulness. For example, if you look at cystic fibrosis, the, the beneficial effect here is you're slightly more fertile. But if you are someone with CF, if, if they're okay with being slightly more fertile and having the disease, they're probably going to say no. But from an evolutionary perspective, it does increase their fitness, which is, might be why it's been selected for and why it still exists in the human population. And if you want more examples of these, this paper at the bottom here, um, it was published in December, so it's very recent. And there are abs sorry, absolutely tons of examples of to where this occurs in humans. It's really interesting. So back to my model organism, my worms. Um, so this is Prestiancha specificus here in this picture. It's attacking a C. elegans. Um, and it, clearly it doesn't stand much hope. But these... These worms of Pristiancha specificus get a late life disease called cuticular blistering disease. And it happens when they're an older adult, so they've done most of their reproducing. And there's also a natural variation for this. So some strains do have it and some don't. And we don't know about the genetic basis for this yet. It hasn't even been that well characterized. My PR reported it in the literature for the first time within the first five years in the species, so it's all quite new. But it's a really good way to be able to look at the MA and AP theories because you've got a metazone organism that only lives for about 30 to 40 days and you can see blistering in the first couple of weeks. And if you were going to look at these theories in humans, it would quite literally take longer than a lifetime. So this sort of silvery blob on, on the top here is what the disease looks like. Um, it's in their cuticle and it stops them from being able to move and sometimes it can rupture and their insides can come out um, and end in their demise. Um, again, we're not quite sure why that happens, but the picture above is, is what it looks like when I'm looking down my microscope to see what they're all doing and see which ones are still alive and which ones are aging. So the first thing I'm going to do when I get back, something I actually started but had to throw out, unfortunately, um, is going to be a lifespan assay. So I've got two strains here of the worms, um, RS2333, which we know does blister, and RS5208, which we know doesn't blister, as in this graph down here, I've marked the ones I'll be using. So I'm going to cross these, and then when I've done that, I can split them into two piles, which ones do blister and which ones don't, and I'm hoping to do some sort of quantitative trait analysis or something similar to be able to find the genetic basis that determines blistering. I'm also going to be looking at other factors, life history factors as well, of, of this species to compare blistering and non-blistering to see if it is antagonistic pleiotropy. Do they have a phenotype that's helpful for them as well and then they later go on to blister? That would be sort of a good clue of where to look. So it could be it extends their lifespan, as in it helps them live for longer and then they get the disease and die. But I'm not sure if it is that one because previous work has shown that these two strains live for a very similar length of time. But I'm going to check it out anyway, just in case. Um, for Candidate, this is a very simple increase in fitness. They have more babies, they're going to be fitter. It's going to be more useful. 
also body size maybe one or something completely different that I haven't even considered that could be useful so it's gonna be a lot of um, observations alongside actually recording these as well also I'm going to be looking at dietary restriction this is a really interesting topic in aging and health span studies it's been looked at in, in lots of different species it basically means restricting the calorific intake at different points during the life actually makes um, animals live longer a lot of people think this is true in humans as well and there is some research to suggest it could be true but um, we're definitely not 100 percent sure yet but i'm going to try this on my worms i'm going to restrict their um e. coli intake at different stages in their life just using the same lifespan assay to see if it affects whether they blister or not or how long they live and also if it affects the two strains differently because i could show something too also pharmaceuticals I've already mentioned antioxidants, but this is very much going to depend on what's available to me at, when I get to doing this. Um, so I can hit them with loads of antibiotics at different times to see if this affects their health span or lifespan. Um, and there's in particular a drug I really want to try called resveratrol, which humans are actually taking and they're quite expensive because they believe it's going to prolong their lifespan. And there is evidence as well, some evidence that it might. But again, we need more work into it. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try this on my worms as well to see maybe there might be a difference in the genetic basis that helps the way it reacts with them. Or it might make them live longer in different amounts depending on, on the genetic basis. We, we just don't know what's going to happen. I'm also going to be doing some transmission electron microscopy of the P. pacificus cuticle to be able to better characterise cuticular blistering disease. And because, of, because I'm in lockdown, um, at the moment I'm working on a literature review of the usefulness of different nematode species in quantitative trait loci mapping analysis and to see which fields it's contributed different, differently to and, um, and where, where we're looking to go in the future as well. So overall, the ageing and lifespan industry is set to be the world's biggest, yet we don't understand everything about ageing. Most of the studies are proximal, so they're looking at um, sort of things like cellular biology and you, you've probably heard of telomere shortening and that kind of thing which is still very useful research but not as much has been done on the evolution behind it and why it's even here in the first place the evolution perspectives that are widely accepted at ma and ap again if you're more interested in this there are sort of subsections within each of these as well that you can explore and the genetic basis of cuticular blistering disease and p pacificus will be used to examine this at some point in the near future hopefully and I'll also be using this model organism to explore dietary restriction, pharmaceuticals, and to better characterise the disease. So I'd like to thank my PI, Dr. Cameron Weddick, the Sommer Lab in Germany for their worms, Royal Society of Biology for their money, and Carmen and everybody at Byroom for making today possible. Thank you.